Father Victor Perez, how are you? Doing great. How are you? Great. Thank you for making the trip over here to St. Faustina. My pleasure. My family lives pretty close, so it's pretty easy. That's awesome. I understand they're parishioners here. They sure are. Mm-hmm. They That's switch what... between my church and this church. Oh, <laughs> does that feel bad for you? Like, oh, they're not here this week. No. It's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's closer, so it's exactly. it's a lot more convenient That's for them. Right. Do you prefer Perez? Perez? How do you prefer uh, it? I grew up as Perez. Perez. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty but much how... of course, the... I have a Spanish community I serve, so of course it's Perez, and I'm half Perez. Cuban. So oh, uh, okay. it's definitely Perez, the right way to pronounce it. But, you know, growing up in, in the U.S. and on Dallas and then Houston, it's always Perez, right? Perez, so okay. Been, mm-hmm. Now, we've seen you at Father David Michael's concert a couple of years ago playing the drums. We've also seen you at the Priest versus Seminarian basketball game several mm-hmm. years running. And now... Yes. We have you on the show. Thank you. We mm-hmm. had you for a short snippet before the basketball game. <laughs> That's right. Now it's time for us to get to know you. You said you're half Cuban. Mm-hmm. Is that your father or your mother? My dad. Your dad. And yeah. then your your mom? My mom's American. Um, her dad was worked for the Air Force. It was a pilot. And so she, she traveled throughout. But my parents met in college at Virginia Tech. My dad's from Cuba and moved here when he was eight um, mm-hmm. because of Castro. His family fled. So. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. 1960. So is your family historically Catholic on both sides? Yes. Yeah. So you grew up in a Catholic household? Definitely. Here mm-hmm. in the Houston area? Yeah. <clears throat> I was born in Dallas and then um, Louisiana for three years. When I was nine, we moved there. And then since sixth grade, I, from here. Yeah, which which here area of Houston? In Katy. So I'm from Katy. Um, went to Taylor High School, Memorial Parkway, junior high. So... Okay. It was a confirmed at Epiphany. Before that was an altar server at St. John Vianney. So and that's then, awesome. Then then St. Bartholomew when when I was in college, my parents started going there and that's where I did my first mass. So that's like my home parish. So when when you're talking home parish, that's St. Yeah, Bart's. That was the one on the poster for, for the <laughs> seminarians. Did they feel bad at uh, Epiphany? Um, you know, I had left Epiphany. I hadn't since confirmation and then going to college, like I kind of lost touch, really. So not really. Okay. But when I do, when I, I did go back after becoming a new priest to Epiphany, do a mass there, I was like, I know all of like. That's awesome. You, I, I went to this junior high right over here, and, <laughs> uh, Taylor, and so I could relate right away. And it does feel c- more kind of like my home parish sometimes because I did grow up right around the corner from there and going to CCE there. CCE. What was your faith life? Like, were you, did you know that you were going to become a priest when no, you were young? No, no, not at Didn't all. have any aspirations to become a priest. Huh? <laughs> no. What did you want to be when you, uh, when you I were wanted young? to be a baseball player was the first thing. I loved baseball. Uh-huh. And then I was really just having fun and not thinking about a lot of things. And then it wasn't until like college that I was thinking of business, but I went to UT because I'm a like I, I was into drums, playing the drums. So I was hoping that like if business didn't work out, I could always like join a band when I'm in college <laughs> and um, play. So, which I got to play, but not, we never got into serious bands going. Were you in the marching band in high I, school? <clears throat> I was in, for six weeks, I played the marching bass drum uh-huh. in, in high school. I was in band in, in, in junior high. But uh, I didn't take to the big drum marching in the heat. Oh, and yeah. And I ended up leaving uh, to join the tennis team. And uh, I played varsity tennis. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Did, did you do, do that in college as well? No. I kind of got burned out a little bit. Uh, but yeah, we got second in state. Our, uh, Katie Taylor did nice. that year, uh, team tennis. And uh, our girls were amazing. Whenever, um, whenever one guy won, uh-huh. we won because... All the girls always won. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Just a huge celebration when yeah. one guy won anything, huh? <laughs> yeah. Was your family very involved in the parish? Um, really, you know, we just went to Mass on Sunday. And mm-hmm. uh, so we'd go to CCE. I remember I was at St. John Vianney in eighth grade, CCE. Uh, I, I got in trouble a couple of times. I remember making fun of whatever, like the teacher and... Me and my friend, you know, trying being to be, a smart being kid. funny, uh-huh. making fun of everything. Uh, uh, you were one of those kids, yeah, huh? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> so uh, we had times where Mary, you know, like the rosary would come, like we'd pray the rosary as a family. Uh-huh. 
whenever they brought the statue over or on car trips, but it was never like a weekly or even a monthly thing at the home. Um, but we said grace before meals. We knew we were Catholic. I, wore, uh-huh. I did wear a scapular since I was in sixth grade that my mom gave me. And she always says that I'm the one kid that didn't take it off. I always left it on. And throughout high school, people are like in tennis. I remember like, what's that stamp you're wearing? The dog tags, yeah. the Catholic dog tags that you got on. <laughs> it's like it's a scapular, and I didn't really know how to explain it. But ah, yeah. yeah. Now, you said we. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have a younger brother and younger sister, so I'm the oldest of three. And my brother Nick is in St. Louis. Uh, his fam- He's married and has four little kids, four kids under 11. And my sister, um, the same, married here in Katy with four kids. Now, did either one of them, like when you were growing up, did did your parents say, oh, th- that one is more likely to join religious life or was it you? They thought my brother would. Your brother. They thought so was, he and, was the odds on favorite, yes, not you. Father Albert and St. Bart's would p- point him out, would think my brother. And uh, so, but it ended up being me, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. God had other plans for both of you. Mm-hmm. Now, you said that you weren't thinking about religious life at all so during high school and college did you date around a lot or I sure did yeah um yeah in high school I'd say hmm when was that yeah I mean just going to dances uh-huh um and yeah senior year I had a high school girlfriend which was cool and then that ended in the summer but then yeah just dating in college um it wasn't until I really discovered my Catholic faith that I finally had like a good girlfriend, mm. uh, which is my my senior year, uh, my fourth year, I should say, of college, like after my conversion experience, which happened my third year of college when I studied in Spain. Oh, how did that happen? <laughs> so yeah, uh, third year of college, I go to Sevilla, Seville, um, and I wanted to spend a semester there because my cousin had done that and we had been there on vacation. So I ended up staying a semester there in Spain. And my first two years, you know, I was partying a lot, drinking, you name it. Uh And um, I ended up my second year joining a fraternity and went to Spain and, of course, got to Spain and and just loved it. Uh, It was all these Americans were kind of like the ugly Americans. They just take over the town. Like we just think we go to all the the clubs and everything. And um, sure, so the partying continued. Did people roll their eyes at you? Oh, here come the Americans. Was uh, that it or, or is it here comes the party? I don't know. I mean, we're all, we kind of, <laughs> probably some people did, but uh-huh. yeah. I mean, there were a lot of Americans. Y'all were just concentrated on having fun. Huh? Yeah. So it was on having fun. We all get to a hotel and uh, like, and everybody's just meeting everyone, like going out and then while we're getting orient for orientation. I remember like that it was a Sunday and I remember thinking I need to go to church. And and I just basically went to this Gothic cathedral and the, the, which is like huge where Christopher uh Columbus or no Queen Isabel and Ferdinand are buried in Sevilla. Oh. And I just like went in front of the tabernacle and just sat there and I just knew that I had to be there on a Sunday. And I, I, it, to me, you know, just sitting there was enough. You know, I wasn't going to mass that day that time. Uh, you went all alone. I went all alone, and uh-huh. just part of me knew I needed to break away from that crowd and just be with, with the Lord. Um, my mom used to call me every Sunday during college mm. to make sure I went to Mass. So that chipped away at you, yeah. and you eventually you did. Is that when you had your well, conversion starting I, I there? I always did because she called me, and okay. so I always went to Mass. <laughs> okay. So eight, eight, I went go to the 8 p.m. or 10 p.m. Uh, mass at UT. Okay, but then at the... In, in Spain, yeah. So, in Spain, that continued. That uh, continued. She didn't call me every Sunday, but I, I found a church. You know. To now go. you said you, you you did a lot of party. Did you run with the bulls in Spain? No, that didn't happen. No, in I was in okay. the south. Okay, in so Pampoma. they didn't do anything like that yeah. over there. No, but it was a lot of fun. It was a great time um, traveling around Spain and things. And yeah. you got to visit these awesome churches. Yes. Yeah. It, that's. Um, and then Holy Week, which is, there's beautiful processions and the um, the Nazarenes, they dress up the, these penitents with the hooded, kind of looks like KKK for here, but it's not. They're penitent and they um, 
brings beautiful statues of Mary and Jesus through the crowd, through the um, town. It's just packed. But it was really in Spain, um, just the experience of my own misery and like sin that I got to a point, you could say, where I realized I needed to come back. Uh -huh. you know, I need to start. Um, so I started, I had a rosary that I would always keep on my bedside. And so it was really like, I guess one day after um, a night of partying and things, and I just, I, I just like started praying the rosary. I just felt this call to kind of grow closer to God and beg for his mercy. So I, I considered a time of reconciliation with God. Um, it was 2000, February of the year 2000. Did any event trigger this or did it just happen? Um, sin, <laughs> you know. So uh, basically, and then I needed to, yeah, so I go, go to confession and um, I remember just the, telling the priest that I wanted, for some reason, like I had gone to confession a few times, a couple times. And then the second time that um, I asked the priest, I told the priest I was going to go to Fatima to visit, mm. which was, um, you know, I don't know how I, I remembered Fatima, maybe because of the statue that visited my family, but I knew that I just, there was a something over there in Portugal. Uh -huh. which is, so I took, I ended up in the priest was like, you don't need to go to Fatima. And I was like, well, I want to go. So maybe something in your CCE class stuck with you somehow. Yeah, and you don't remember. You know. Yeah. They planted a seed there. Yeah. I ended up going to all these holy sites, the Jubilee year and uh, going to Fatima, getting off the bus. Everybody else gets off at Lisbon and I, I'm the only one getting off at Fatima and the doors open. It's just black on one side. It's just like nighttime and it's just, it's like an empty field. And then they're just like a little residencia hostel. So I go and eat there. I ask, you know, where's, where's the place to go in, in, in Spanish? And they're speaking Portuguese and they, they tell me where to go. And I, I walk through these cobblestone streets to the, this, and then this huge plaza opens up and this chapel you know, of glass and the light. And you see Mary's image there. And then these candles, I end up going and lighting a candle for my family, each of the members of my family going in front of Our Lady and praying. Uh, it was, and I went to bed that night in this like cool little residence hostel that was like all wood. And I remember how clean it felt. And I was like, this is like church. It feels like church. Like Wow. And I remember I was like, this is what I need. Like there was this desire for order in my life. Uh -huh. um, I was, I was heavier than I am now. I was, you know, beer belly, um, just kind of a slob, you could say. Uh -huh. Not ordered, my life was not ordered. And so- you weren't living a very healthy lifestyle. No, mm -hmm. no. And so I think, uh, it's a funny story, but I'll tell it later. But when I first thought about being a priest, the first thing I asked was, when do we get to retire? <laughs> <laughs> so that, which, which, yeah. Well, the retirement benefits are very nice for yeah, priests, you know. Right, uh, <laughs> right. But that, In the next life. <laughs> but so that was, uh, and I remember at Fatima, so, I basically ended up um, the next day having um, this going to mass and um, I tried to go to confession, but it was full or it was closed. Sorry, it was closed. And then I'm about to get on the, at, back at the hostel and these two nuns from Sevilla were like, we have to go. The bus is about to leave for Sevilla. I was like, I haven't gone to confession. And so I grab all my bags and um, I run to the confession across the plaza uh -huh. and to this house of confessions, Casa de Confesiones. And I open the door and it's just packed with people. And I'm there huffing and puffing because I just run so far to get to the confession. Uh -huh. and, and all these people are in line. And then there's this nun in the very front and she she points to me and she tells she calls me and puts me in front of everyone. Oh, wow. And she tells the people, maybe she told them I was already there before. I don't remember her. But I, I get into the confessional right away, uh -huh. and there's this beautiful, like, English, uh, be British English, you know, confessor. They're like, um, speak, you know, to me, son. Like, and then I, I go to confession, and, and the priest um, says, you know, have courage and don't condemn yourself. These two things that I needed to hear. And um, wow, that's what I realized I was missing was courage, because I was always trying to be popular, always uh, trying to you know, not really embracing my, my faith, always kind of just doing what fits in, you know? Uh-huh. Well, and then, yeah. yeah. And then don't condemn us. And then I just realized, wow, how merciful God is. Like he forgives me. Like he's so good. Like when, like I'm off, like I got off basically. Like 
Um, it's that easy, like, wow, God is so merciful. So, and I yeah. got this second chance. And so it just really hit how good God is. And I just felt his love at that moment through that priest. And so that kind of started the process of really praying um, and um, this joy with the Lord. And then I could go on, but I I went back to UT, got involved in the um, Longhorn Awakening. Okay. So yeah, it was a retreat I had gone on as a sophomore, but it was not an awakening because I was too cool. You know, I didn't want to leave my friends that, that drank, you know, all these things they were doing. I didn't want to leave my friends. So mm. I was like, I felt too weak. I, it was, I felt for a moment that I was like holy. And then I would just follow the friends and just do whatever uh, they, so it wasn't- You slipped and back yeah. into it, uh-huh. So it wasn't until when I got back from Spain after that, that whole experience, because by the way, I stayed for two semesters in Spain. It was in the beginning of my second semester that um, I had my conversion because my teacher in Spain said, you can't leave after one semester. You need to learn more Spanish. And I was like, he's right. Like I thought I'd be fluent right away just by being there. Uh -huh. It takes a lot of work. So <laughs> I stayed the second semester and that's when all my friends that came with me left. So I was really immersed in the Spanish culture mm. and my family I was living with. And that's when I... Had that conversion. So going there, did you know how to speak some Spanish or none at all? Um, or I had taken it in uh, eighth grade and then and throughout high school. So I did AP Spanish and my dad spoke. So I guess it was easier for me to learn just having heard it somewhat uh -huh. growing, up, growing up. Though we, my mom and we didn't speak it in as, as a family though. Mm -hmm. um, so it was uh, when I got back to to UT, there was a, one girl, like when you're gone for a whole school year, you forget everyone, at least I did, like uh -huh. at the Catholic Center, you you forget everyone. So I forgot like everyone at the Catholic Center, but the one person that I remembered was my godmother on the first awakening retreat that that um, I went on and she was praying for me the whole time. Her name's Maria actually, and uh, she's from Katy. And she um, approached me and said, um, do you, you know, Victor, you know, welcome back. Like, I'm leading a retreat, the, the next awakening. We'd like you to uh, staff it. Would you consider staffing it? And I was like, sure, because I had already been thinking about the priesthood, which I skipped that part. I hadn't got well, the first time I want to be a priest. But I end up writing on my application that I want to be a dad on this retreat, which is like a counselor, uh, the yeah, one of the counselors. You're paired up with okay. a, a wife and you have six kids. Those are the retreatants. Okay. I said, I want to be a dad because I'm thinking about being a priest. Okay. And so um, I later found out that they bumped me up to like put me my application in front of everyone else because I said I wanted to be a priest. Oh. And it was at that moment where I really, um, at that retreat, kind of surrendered and said, Lord, use me like this always. I felt God using me. Um, I saw converg huge conversions in my kids, um, these college kids that I was ministering to that it was like the first time in that retreat that I felt so unselfish, um, just being used by God. Uh -huh. to show his love. And um, this girl on the retreat, she had like pink hair. She was like kind of rebel, like the the, the the little sister of the really popular guy in the Catholic center. Um, and then she had, like, we had this kind of connection, I guess. And she had a big conversion on the retreat. And it was, it was, it was amazing. So when you came back, did a, did a lot of your friends notice that difference in you? Sure. Definitely. Um, did they say anything? Yeah. I mean, none of my friends were Catholic. You know, so my roommates, um, you know, they had weed in the house. And I was like, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I don't want that here, you know. Uh -huh. um, and uh, what else? Yeah, just in some of my, I ended up leaving a year early to become a priest, um, to join the seminary. And one of them, they were like, you're making a big mistake, you know. And, I, you know, this guy, uh, roommate Chuck, he was just, you're, giving me, you're making a real big mistake. Um, and so, yeah, they made fun of me a little bit. Um, oh, wow. Called me Father Victor. Oh, wow. Um, that's funny. The first people to call you Father Victor were the the ones who were making fun of you. Exactly. Wow. So, so do you, so you just had to just cut them off as friends, huh? Well, you know, yeah. I mean, some of them we did on, on Facebook. Like they were just one of them was so anti-religion that, um, yeah, we just started lost touch, you know. So, uh, so I met with a few of them, you know, after I was a seminarian um, once. Or you know, like lunch and things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we definitely weren't as, cl as close as friends. We kind of uh, lost touch a little bit, but I still pray for them, so. Wow, but of yeah. course you made 
n- new friends in the in the Catholic Center. Yeah, and then eventually, and and uh, like I mentioned that I had I had that. So even though I was thinking about being a priest, so but I'm gonna go back a little bit. When I was after Fatima, I ended up going to Lourdes. Oh, okay, really? And uh, yes, so that was in May 13th, 2000, which is actually the day of Fatima. But I was in Lourdes and visited there, and um, and I just really you know praying. I ended up going to take the baths, you know, these the springs that heal people. Uh huh. Um, and then I had a priest bless my rosary in Spanish. He's a Spanish priest, and he said. Um, after he he blessed my rosary, he's like, show me around Lourdes. And then all of a sudden I was looking at him and it just came out of me. I said, how do you become a priest? He's like, you want to be a priest? And I was like, yeah. And I just couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe it. And, and when I said, yeah, I like kind of laughed and it felt so good. And then I was like, oh no, God heard me. <laughs> you know, as I go back to the, to my hostel, I was like, oh no, God heard me. And, um, so I just followed that back in my head. But then it was at the awakening later, um, October of that same year of 2000, where I surrendered to that moment I was telling you in the awakening retreat. But that was the first moment when I vocalized it. Now, you said you left a year early to enter the seminary. Mm-hmm. What triggered you into go uh, to filing that application? Was there Was it just something that made sense or... Yes. Did you wrestle with it for a while? So the retreat that I told you where I was a dad uh-huh. and I surrendered, said, Lord, you use me like this always. Uh-huh. I, for me, that meant the priesthood. It was like, it was always there. And the summer I had gotten back from Lourdes, I went to a Marian conference with my parents in San Antonio. I met, I heard Benedict Groeschel, Father Benedict Groeschel speak. And I ended up seeing a um, advertisement for these a religious order of priests there called the Legionaries of Christ. Mm. And with the, these, all these young men wearing cassocks and I was attracted to it. So I wrote my name down. And um, this is now before this retreat, but after I had said I was thinking about being a priest in Lourdes in the summer. And so um, they had contacted me, but it was, and then I had asked about being, when do y'all retire? As I mentioned, but it, <laughs> it wasn't, but it was after the, that, that moment of surrender and, um, the retreat where to me it was like, I'm gonna call the legionaries. I'm gonna explore that. And that's what I did. So the legionaries were the first thing, not diocesan priesthood. Yeah, so like that's really what was what had fallen in my lap was the legionaries. Uh-huh. So when I thought of to be a priest, that's that's what was like the next order of business was to visit the legion. And um yeah, so even though when I went to visit the legion, um I I remember going to to confession there and and I'd mentioned my girlfriend because on that awakening retreat, I, I, you know, I met all these great Catholic people and of course a great Catholic girl and we were dating, but I was also thinking about being a priest. Oh, wow. That's tough. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was kind of oblivious to it. It was so embarrassing. I even went to like a party with her family and I ended up saying that I was uh, thinking about being a priest, you know, it's just. So you're dating was, a girl and thinking about being a priest. Yeah. So it was at that retreat that I kind of realized that I needed to, um, you know, focus just on the priesthood and and not be dating. And so, what did she say when you mentioned that you were thinking about becoming a priest? Um, you know, she was actually real supportive. Praise the Lord! And uh, ended up kind of, you know, she knew it was just. I said, was, if this is God's will, yeah, she knew it was the time that that was for me and things like that. So, um, just certain experiences that I knew. But you asked about what was the thing that made me want to apply? Uh So I was still um, dating dating this girl, and then I was studying for finals, the statistics test at UT at the Catholic Center. Um, It was before we moved out of that, of they had to move out of the one that they're in now to St. Austin's, and as they renovated the, the current one. And um, I remember, like, it was an amazing night. We were, st- I was studying, and, but I could not study because I was so focused on God. Like, I kept visiting the tabernacle, like, God, you're here. Like, this uh-huh. is so awesome. <laughs> and I, I'm, it was a statistics test in business, and I'm like, I don't not care about this stuff. Wow. And here I am, and I'm trying to study, but I'm going to the tabernacle saying, God is here. And then all of a sudden it starts snowing, 
on um, December 8th. It's like, I think it was Immaculate Conception or Our Lady Guadalupe. And um, I ended up like staying up all night studying. Like I called the school. I was like, y'all got to cancel classes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Because it's snowing. Because it's snowing. But uh-huh. It's so, but I ended up taking this test in statistics and um, just doing horrible on it. And later I'll find out I get a D, but I thought I failed it. I got an F. And so I, I go back to the Catholic Center and I sit in front of the tabernacle again. And all of a sudden this, I'm sitting there like, I, and I put my arms up on the chairs, on the pews. I'm like, Lord, I'm like, what am I supposed to do? And then this girl comes out of nowhere and, and she's like crying. And she sits like two seats next to me. And she starts opening up about, and I've never seen her before. And she starts opening up to me about how homesick she is. Oh. And, you know, she lives in Kinsolving in the dorm. And I was like, I felt like I was hearing her confession. Oh. So at that moment, I was like, that's the sign. And I said, you know, to be a priest. This is what you want to do. Like, leave now. (laughs) Because I was, I had just failed this statistics class. Uh, test because you didn't care about it. Yeah, I didn't care about it, and then all of a sudden I'm ministering to this person that that God put there, and and I kind of felt, and I, I was like, I felt like I felt like a priest. I remember thinking that, and so I knew that was that was a sign to just to yeah, go. God, God put her there, yeah, as a message. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is what you yeah. you care about. This is what you want to do. So you sent that application. Now was it to the to, legionaries? To Christ. the legionaries? Yes. So why aren't you with them now? What happened? Yeah. So. uh I was a year there in Connecticut and it was a beautiful time, you know, with other young men and just like conquer the world for Christ, you know, um, go on hikes, we PE, like uh, soccer, um, you know, you pray an hour each morning um, and uh, every hour is accounted for, like you're, you have a constant schedule. Oh, it's very strict. Very, very strict. You live in cubicles uh-huh. um, that, with a curtain that separates you, and there's like a desk in front of your your cubicle, and um, there's just all, everybody's rooms next to each other in these cubicles. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it was just like a different world. Like you totally like leave the world behind. You were in a cassock right away, uh-huh. except for the first summer. You're wearing a white shirt and black tie. I had, I loved it, but my second year I went to Mexico as well, to Monterey, which even helped my Spanish even more. But it was it was just too strict. I'll be honest. For me, it wasn't for you. It, it was not for me. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think I was trying to earn God's love. I think I was trying to really over. I kind of overdid it. I think I I was trying like there's a lot of little rules, and I was trying to like do them all perfectly. Whereas other guys were just like not made a big deal about it and stuff like that. So just for me, it, it wasn't. I, I guess it wasn't a good fit. And so they mm-hmm. kind of helped me see that too. And when I left uh, Legion, I went to, uh, I got on the airplane and this person took my uh, ticket and I heard the words, gracias padre, thank you father. And I, he could have said compadre, which is like a, hey dude, uh-huh. but he, I heard padre. So I took it as a sign because I wasn't wearing a collar. I just had a white shirt on, black tie. And um, so. Do you think you maybe thought you were a priest because of the way you were carrying yourself perhaps? <laughs> maybe. I don't know. But I got on the plane and I said, I'm going to call Bishop Fiorenza. And that's what I did. I still feel called to be a priest. And I called them and they received me. Um, Bishop Fiorenza, because I had asked Bishop, before going to Legion, I checked in with Bishop Fiorenza and he tried to talk me out of going to Legionaries. Just like. He um, thought it wasn't for you. Yeah. And he said, come to the diocese. You know, your last name's Perez. That means son of Peter, Peter's diocese. <laughs> uh, and I remember him saying that. And so. Uh, but you had to see it for yourself. Yeah, I had to see it for myself. Now, what did your family say when, you know, when, when you were doing all of this? The very first time that you told them, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to Legionaries. What did you do? Okay, so I told my parents on the, on the phone, I'm going to go visit the Legionari- Legionaries of Christ in Connecticut. Did it shock them? Yeah, they said, what is that? Who are they? And I was like, they're order of priests. And they started crying on the phone, you know. We, and my dad's like, we had an idea. Because they heard me, they got teary. They they had heard of me traveling around uh, to go into Fatima, Lourdes. Uh-huh. They're telling Father Albert, the priest and Katie at St. Bart. And uh, so they kind of suspected. So once I told them, of course, they were excited. 
they were happy. And my dad says that God really prepared him for that, that maybe if, if I had said that three years earlier, he probably might not have been supportive, but... Might have been a more of a shock for yes, them, huh? But my parents had their own reawakening and um, growing in their faith and, um, you know, reading apologetics and, and things like that, really awakening their faith and uh, going to adoration and praying the rosary, so... That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So, so they did they say, oh, we knew it was you this time instead of your brother? Or did they say anything to that effect? Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing with my brother wasn't that ever that serious, but it was just, that's kind of Father Albert would always say that. Just uh, a joke in passing. Kind of a joke. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like how Father Dad does this every once in a while. Yes. Yeah. To, to some of the young men. It, when, when I was on uh, a ski trip with my, uh, we were in Angel Fire and uh, this was around this period of time of me leaving uh, or at the end of UT, my UT Austin time, my parents were like, you should tell Nick and Caroline, tell your brother and sister. And um, so that night, you know, I'm sleeping in one bed, my sister's sleeping in another bed, my brother's in, sleeping on the floor in between us. And uh, and I was like, hey guys, uh, think about, it's dark, you know, we're all laying down. I was like, hey guys, I'm thinking about being a priest. And uh, my sister's like, oh, really? She's like, I always thought you were going to have a family. Uh -huh. And I said, your family will be my family. And then, um, and so my mom, my sister later says she would love that. But my brother later tells my sister, don't worry. He's just going through a Godfather phase. Because mm. I loved the, um, at the time I loved the movie, The Godfather. Uh. <laughs> so I thought that's why I wanted to be a priest. <laughs> So he thought it wasn't going to stick. He thought you were going to eventually discern out. Yeah. I mean, I think once I went, he knew I was going to stick with it. But yeah, he just thought maybe it was a passing thought. Or maybe he, he was just saying that to be funny, too. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. So when you went into the seminary, was it this is it all the way straight 100%? Or were there times where you thought I might discern out? Um. It was pretty much 100% until um, a good moment. Going to the diocesan seminary um, was a little culture shock, just different. It was right after the scandals, 2003, and the scandals were 2002 in Dallas. That's where I started. And um, so I had to l learn a lot, and um, I started you know, reading Theology of the Body, reading St. Therese, it's more like this growing to trust more in God's love and um, and His mercy. And I got to a point where I was just, had this vision of me, like, I don't know, it's funny, um, this like vision of me, like walking with a, a, a lady on the river walk, like almost like it was my wife, you okay. know, on the river walk in Austin, I don't know, or uh, San Antonio, that's like just picturing myself like on vacation or something. And I remember um, I was, this happened like while I was praying the Stations of the Cross. It was really weird because I would do that. But I remember just like at that moment, I chose like, you know, that I wanted to help Jesus carry his cross, mm -hmm. you know? And so kind of like where I, I realized I don't have to be a priest. So it was a big moment where I, you know, I realized I can serve God in other ways. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of when I was doing the Stations of the Cross at that moment and thinking, having kind of that, that vision of, of me possibly having a wife where I kind of chose, I feel like the call to, you know, help Jesus carry his cross and um, minister to his people as a priest. So I never had a, I wasn't all like going through it thinking I might leave. I think that there was somebody at a reception, um, wedding reception, my cousin, um, Tony's dad, and he said, just, he's like, you want to be a priest, go, be a priest. He's like, go for it. And another priest had told me, he's like, whatever you see, keep going. And and I feel like if we just, we have to set our minds to it and God will tell us that if it's not his will, he'll, and I always say that, Lord, open the doors. Mm -hmm. If this is not your will, close the door, you know? So, um, cause seminary is also preparation. It's not just discernment. You have to prepare to be a priest. Uh -huh. So you don't want to be half in and half out. But that was kind of my thought about that. And um, speaking of the door being closed, did you have any friends, you know, classmates that discerned out and 
Yes. Yes. Did you have any and difficulty always, with that? I did. Um, yeah, you know, I'd try to talk, I talk to them and things like that. Uh, when, but I, I also come to realize that, you know, it's okay. You know, some people find are not all that go to the seminary might be, have to discern out and that's mm-hmm. God's will. A lot of guys left that were in the seminary, um, ahead of me, like a year ahead of me. That was kind of hard, but, um, it was a hard time, I think, also in the seminary, as I mentioned, um, when I was there. But it's gotten a lot better. It's I'm impressed, super impressed with the seminary now, mm-hmm. and this even the, se- the seminary in Dallas. Uh, many even like when I was first ordained, just hugely improved. The guys are like number one at intramurals. Just really impressive, uh-huh. man, really impressive men at UD and uh, here too. Um, so, yeah. You said that you know. You mentioned the scandals when you when you went in. Did, is mm-hmm. that something that kind of made you think twice about entering the seminary? You know, no. You know, even that priest that I asked, um, how do you be a priest in Lourdes? Like, he was not the best priest. I don't even go through all the details. Uh-huh. Um, I could just sense something when I went to confession. But I knew that the priesthood is real and that I'm not going to let... I, I just didn't think about it. Maybe it's our Blessed Mother protecting me from being scandalized and recognizing that it, the priesthood is of Christ. It's his priesthood, you know. Because it, it's very tough. I mean, very brave of you, you know, in the midst of all that to say, yes, I want to be a priest. You know, other some of your your other classmates, who was in the seminary at the same time as you that eventually did become priests? Oh, um, so Father Uriel Manzano... Um, Arthur Unachuku, who's my good friend, he's in Dallas. Uh-huh. Um, and then Judah Zuma, uh, we we're classmates, and so is Urel. And then Fong Nguyen, we we're all th- in the classmates. Uh, Luke Millette. Um, and then, uh, let's see, who else? Yeah, Marcel, Tom Her- Hawkshurst, Marcel Oy- uh, Koye, um, or Sebastian Koye, Mar- Marcel Oye. Uh, yeah, d- there's a this was that's what's great about being at a diocesan seminary is um or in Halapesca, uh is that you you know you get to meet all these guys that are you're gonna be with you know and so but a lot of my there were, in my class there are a lot of guys from Austin you know other dioceses as well so now when you you had some friends or classmates that discerned out did it make you think twice you know this guy's holier than me and maybe I should Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Yeah, none of my like, yeah. There's one guy that did leave uh, from that that did really impact all of us. It was tough, and so that was. But that was kind of farther along. We were already finished our pastoral year. Oh, that far down, huh? Yeah. So I was. I went to St. Paul's in Nassau Bay, where Father David Michael was the altar, an altar boy. Oh, wow. So you were there and he was an altar boy. Yeah. So That's I was awesome. A seminarian. Mm-hmm. And his dad was the head of altar servers. That's awesome. Yeah, it was neat. Did, so did you look at him and say, yeah, th- he's going to become a priest or? No, I didn't actually. Really? Like, I, yeah, you don't just look right away. Yeah. I think he was just a really good altar boy and uh-huh. he was a good teen. Now, father, dad said that um, he was, he worried about uh, Father David Michael when he was, you know, uh, when he was trying to recruit him for the seminary, and he was saying that they, there were a lot of girls around him. Was it that way when when you were there? That, that... Uh, I think he had one girlfriend, and um, but like I said, he was like probably eighth or ninth grade. So okay, it was so really, still pretty was, early. Yeah. What was that like being there in in that parish the first time? Because this is. This is your first time in that capacity of, you know, as a seminarian, looking at the priesthood, being there, working there at the the church. What was that experience like? That was a great experience. It was Hurricane Ike oh. had just happened, and we ended up going cleaning uh, houses. David Michael's with us. I have these old pictures. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was just great to lead um, the youth. Uh, the Hispanic, that was my first really big getting involved in Hispanic culture. You know, the Hispanic masses, I would preach, which you're not really not supposed to. As is not, or you'd give not, a talk. Then. I give a talk, a yeah. reflection. <laughs> yes, um, a reflection. Yeah. Yes. And so that was 
good, great experience at St. Paul's. I remember just like wanting to learn about this region of being at St. Paul's, like like NASA, like Kobayashi, like all these, like the history of the area. Like I love that as a Dawson priest, you, like, you get immersed in wherever you're sent. Mm, and, like The culture of that yeah, area. And just, like, I want to get to know the history of it uh -huh. and just like really embrace it. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Now, Going back into the seminary, let's talk about the seminary again. What was you said that there was a bit of a culture shock? Were you not prepared to be just around just guys and you know the the whole uh, the whole structure of a seminary? So the culture shock I meant was switching from the legionaries to okay the diocese. Now how it was a, a, just very different. Yes. Yeah, so one was um, extremely uber strict. holy uh -huh. and and strict. And all the real, but not, it wasn't like they were like over you, like yelling at you or uh -huh. strict. No, it was just, it's just constant. Um, the schedule. Schedule, yeah. yeah. But there was this real emphasis on charity, on uh -huh. love, on, on like, and everybody was so nice to everyone. And uh, so it was really beautiful. So get to the diocese and at that point you didn't feel that as much. So um yeah, that's all I'm going to say. Is it, is it a lot younger guys? So they're a little immature, you know? They were, no, they were younger guys at the Legion, I'd say, because they'd got guys straight out of... Out of high school? Out of high school. Oh, okay. And I was one of the worldly candidates uh, from the world. It was, uh -huh. was kind of interesting because I'm from... I went to college and all that. Ah. And I remember one concern joining them was like, oh, I can't... Do I have to play soccer? Do I have to like... Because I was like so out of shape, but I actually did get in shape being there. Is, um, it was preparing kind of you for the, the pre-seminary and basketball game. That's what it was doing. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the, in the seminary here in Houston, a lot of our guests talk about pranks that happened in the seminary. Were any big pranks pulled while you were, over, while you were still in the seminary? Mm. Were you the target? Maybe. Probably more of a target than... No, no pranks. Uh yeah. Was it since you, other, other guests said that, you know, they were older, so they didn't want to have to do any of that. They were more concerned with their studies and becoming a priest. Which, which end were you on? Yeah, I was probably more, um, just studying prayerful. I mean, you know, going since you were older, going to the chapel. Yeah, I'd say so. We even had a brought like a huge concert to the seminary when I was there. Shane and Shane. Oh. And uh yeah, it was it was pretty 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 crazy. But it was um some seminarians did that. Uh yeah, I mean, we'd play soccer against San Antonio and basketball. Um, you know, yeah. So it was a it was a good experience. Um and uh going out, yeah, going to study. But I was more focused on just the studies. I I, I can't think of any major pranks. Now, your diaconate year, what, where did you go? I went to Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace, what was yeah. that like? Oh man, that was amazing. It's like high tech, cutting edge parish, you know. You know, um, Father John Keller did a great job. He was a supervisor. I loved the, uh, he really did a good job helping forming me and preaching. He had, he called together a group of old, older men just to hear me preach. And, and practice, um, just to be affirmed. I think he wanted me to be affirmed by them and hearing me preach. Uh -huh. um, and then just, you know, Matt Reggett's, uh, Dave Reggett's, and like going to Steubenville with the youth. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great time. Um, so that was a special parish. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be there, but then uh, Father Urell came there, and then I went to St. Cecilia's. That's where you were, that was your first assignment. Yeah. Now, before you got your assignment, well, after you, you found out about your assignment was your ordination. Do you remember anything specifically specific about that ordination? Anything that sticks with you? Yeah, so I would say my, my I remember my diaconate ordination being much more emotional when I was um, laying prostrate in Litany of Saints. I remember just bawling, like really? shaking just how much I was crying. And, and uh, so that was more, I say, uh, powerful, at least feelings wise, than the uh, priesthood ordination. Although uh, that was definitely amazing, you know. What knowing. were you thinking about when you were bawling? I don't know. It was just 
the saints praying for me and just, you know, I probably had read, you know, John Paul II's letter when he talks about the marble, hitting the marble, uh, -huh. uh you know, being the floor for people like that, the humility. I don't, I don't really remember what I was thinking, but I just, this is like my whole life leading up to this, you know, now I'm about to be, uh, belong to Jesus, you know, and, um, cause when you become a deacon, that's when you make the promise of celibacy. Mm -hmm. So this was it. Yes. That's why it got to you. You're zapped. <laughs> Yeah, because yes. you are clergy from yeah. that point on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty much a point of no return once you're there. Yeah. Wow. Now, your first parish, where did you say it was again? Uh, I was assigned to St. So as a deacon, Prince of Peace, but then as a priest, my uh -huh. first parish was St. Cecilia's. And I remember the Cardinal telling me uh, during the rehearsal, he's like, you're going to St. Cecilia's and have fun, <laughs> which is a perfect thing to say because it is a very fun Really? Parish, a lot of fun people. Um, the school was great, and uh, it was hard to leave that school. Um, and the coolest thing was um, Katie Hartfield, who was the youth minister. She was good friends with Father Arthur from Dallas, who I knew. And I get a call right away that I'm going to World Youth Day in oh, Madrid. Nice. So even before getting ordained, I think I, I was told I'm going to go to World Youth Day. You're going back to Spain. Yes. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. Full circle. Mm -hmm. What year did you go? What year was that in Madrid? 20, that would have been 2011. And what was that like? Um, so oh, you, that was great. I mean, I had been back to Spain to visit the family I'd stayed with before, but going back as a priest, um, and we also had gone to Rome that with Franciscan. It was with Franciscan University, and Dave Pavanka went to Rome, Assisi. Uh, we got to party on St. Clair Day at, in the CC because um, there was like a big party there. Uh -huh. um, but I, what was neat was, um, well, not neat. In Madrid, it was like crazy because it was so hot. The sun was out and they they only like let you bring like two water bottles uh -huh. and um, no umbrellas. So we're just, people are just baking. People are passing out. And you're wearing black. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm And I'm like so like ready to anoint everyone. And so like... <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. That's cool. So is that what you did before you you started your at, at St. Cecilia was you went to Madrid? Yeah, or is it, that was, it was now? August, um, August of the first year of my priesthood. So June 4th, I was ordained. And then August went to uh, Sevilla. I mean, to World Youth Day in Madrid. In Madrid. Yeah. Now, how long were you at St. Cecilia? Uh Two years. Two years. That, that's pretty much the standard, huh? No. I got moved early. Early? Okay. A year, a year early. So They had just, to reshuffle priests? They did. So I got to move to St. Jerome's, which was um, just north of I-10, close to St. Cecilia's, and I had a school too. And um, that was an amazing experience as well. First, I was not happy because I didn't want to leave early. I, I felt it was early, two years. Usually it's three. Uh -huh. And... Uh, and, I, and leaving this school was awesome. I even wrote like a theme song for the school, or I should say a uh, school song. Uh -huh. um, and do they still use it, that song? No, it didn't. I recorded it, but it didn't, uh, it hasn't gotten used. Or okay. I, I kind of left it with them and then I was like, okay, that's nice. But if but you want to use it, you can yeah. use it. Yeah. And then I went to St. Jerome and uh, the Hispanic community just, you know, I got really close to them as well. And uh, St. Cecilia, too, the Spanish community is as close to them as well, too. But, uh, yeah, so St. Jerome, was, I was there three years. And, um, yeah, that was Father Dan, Sheil, a good pastor, you know. And, yeah, so it was Father John Cahoon was at St. Cecilia's, too. He just he was great, too. He let me just do, do whatever, really, just have fun, like, you know, start things. And we helped start vocation ministry, um, a vocation committee. So it was awesome. So he gave you a lot of freedom to, yeah. to, to do, yeah. mm -hmm. to start things. That's awesome. It was good. Now, after that, is that your current posting? Is that when? Nope. I went to Angleton for three years. Mm. As a pastor? Pastor. Yeah. What parish was that? I was exciting. Uh, Most Holy Trinity. So, and uh, I was there for, for three years. Um, you know, it used to be two parishes, St. Basil, St. Thomas. They had merged. Um, and this big, beautiful parish called Most Holy Trinity. 
in Angleton. So you're the one priest of the town. I was the one priest of the town, got to oh. know the superintendent, uh, the mayor. You know, you're kind of a big fish in a, in a little pond. Uh -huh. um, but the people, it's not that small of a town. Though. I don't want to say that. It's So the people are great. There's people that work at Dow, people that work downtown. Um, it's a very diverse, really great town. Um, and so enjoyed that a lot. And uh, that was also a hard move and um, for for me and for for the church um, but now they got a great pastor father coy now so and then and where are you now exactly saint joseph catholic church mm -hmm. and saint stephen so they when i came when i was assigned there was saint joseph saint stephen they were merged okay and they got unmerged mm, so how does that happen yes yes it's very crazy so from 2016 to 2019 they had they were merged okay saint joseph saint stephen you know, they had been merged in 2016. These two churches, they're less than a half a mile apart. Uh, St. Stephen's uh, Mexican church started in 1932. St. Joseph started in 1880 in mm -hmm. um, Houston Avenue, Washington Avenue. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, they were unmerged. Um, and uh, I became pastor of both separately at, at, and, um, at that right of when you get installed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now I do mass at St. Stephen's at two o'clock on Sunday and in Spanish. And then of course, St. Joseph, we have a lot of masses. So so why do, why do they separate? Is it because the congregations just got big again or? Yeah, it has to do with canon law. Okay. And uh, it's kind of complicated. Yeah. Okay. So they unmerged. They did. And then this, how long have you been there at those two parishes? I, I've been there three and a half years now. So that's, it's, I've been longer there than any other church I've been at. So it's gone fast, especially with COVID. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Now you're looking at maybe another move. Have there been any whispers as to where you might end up? No, I'm not looking at another move. You're not? I'm it. not. <laughs> no, I, I, you, I was, I'm, I was probably supposed to, you, pastors are you supposed to be there at least six years. Uh huh. So to me, for me to leave Angleton, um, so you, it er, was a lot earlier. It was, it was early. Oh, okay. So you've been yeah. moved early a lot, huh? Yes. Well, that was the, the, the most early one, but yeah. Uh, the, but, the the one Vickers, when you're an assistant, they can move you a lot They easier. shuffle you around easier. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so, um. So you're yeah. looking at being here so, for at least for the next three to four years. Mm hmm No. If not longer. So, you know, like Father Dad, what he's been here. I forget how long, but but a lot of times it's it's over six years as a pastor, and I think our our cardinal likes people to be stable, um, the pastor to not to be just moving too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it yeah it's more consistency. Yeah, but it's exciting too to see words. We have to remember that it's God's will, and we have to follow God's plan. Yes, it's not just I want to be here. So that's what we, we make a vow of obedience, a promise of obedience, you know, to the cardinal, to the bishop and his successors. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I, I fault, you know. So no matter how hard it might be, yeah. But then you you always seem to end up in a in a great situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God brings good out of everything. Now, you are one of the players with a basketball team. You you were there from the beginning. Yeah, actually, was I was on the first team, so five. I've been in five games, I think. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of I'm in the background. You know, I'm not the main player or anything, but you're a role player. I'm I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> I like being part of the team. I love the brotherhood. Uh huh. You know, Father Chris is on the team. Who's here? Yes. He's really good. Uh, Father David Michael is really good. Um, Joey White is playing. So yeah. Um, oh yeah, he's back. Yeah. TJ, TJ, and I, and Preston. I think we're like one of the first ones. Some of the original. How tall are you? I am 6'2". Six 6'2". Two. Six two. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty good height for basketball. Have you always played basketball or? No. No, it's always baseball. Tennis and baseball. Tennis and, uh, tennis, that's right. Tennis and I did and play baseball. Little League basketball. I played Little League soccer. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah. But the, the movement with ba with tennis is very similar to basketball. So mm -hmm. it, it's not too hard for you to, to adapt your, your skill set there. Not now, I did mention earlier the concert for life, Father David Michael. That must have been pretty tough filling in for, you know, Father Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, we had, uh, David Michael and I have 
had played, you know, as well before at like uh, Priest Got Talent. These talent shows for Priest that oh. Regina Chelly was was doing. Okay. Yeah. So we had been playing before that, um, and uh, kind of knew some of his his songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, and then there was there was one concert where I played like two songs and Ryan played the rest. Yes, I but, remember but that for sure. Is um, yeah, he was on my basketball team. You know, got to know him. Uh huh. And um, you know, um, and then and then we both played the drums. So yeah, I mean, the, I call I call on the guy to pray for me. You know, I call I ask him to pray sometimes. Like I see his picture, like or just. Um, but yeah, it was it was definitely uh, an honor to play for him and his small, but yeah, definitely tough and, as well. Yeah, and he's good. And he he's solid. He he plays the. Uh, I kind of try to like play overplay a little bit. Uh huh. You know, like look at me, everyone, like. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, but he like matches the song like really well. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Well, we thank you so much for for coming in and telling your story. Oh yeah, and we thank you for you know for taking God's call. Thank you and seeing His signs and and for living the life. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, it's great, great talking to you, and um, I'm just blessed. I'm blessed that uh, God's been so good to me, so merciful, and. Uh, it's called me to this to, to serve him, and I just pray that that other people maybe listening to this maybe realize, yeah, God is calling you. You know, what is He calling you to? Um, maybe priesthood um, for a girl to be a sister, um, but just to serve Him. Maybe being in a marriage, we need holy marriages, holy families. So um, it's a joy to serve God.